Once again, before we get to our scripture for this morning, I'm going to ask you some questions that I think will help you both get to know each other a little better and will actually orient you to the big themes in Genesis chapter 4. So this morning, I want to ask you three questions. Here's the first one. As a child, what homemade birthday presents do you recall giving your folks? Pause me and go around the room and everybody share. Okay, here's your second question. Whom did you envy as a child? And why this person? Okay, here's your final question before we get to our scripture. How do you handle anger? Are you like one of these guys? Vern Volcano? Susie Suppression? Tina Tight Lip? Dennis Denial? Or what? How do you handle anger? As you listen to the scripture this morning, pay a special attention to how the choices Cain made early in his life rippled through and affected who he was and his situation later in life, and even affected what happened to his kids in their lives. Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, With the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, What have you done? Listen. Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, he will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain, so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain lay with his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was then building a city, and he named it after his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Erad, and Erad was the father of Mehuyael, and Mehuyael was the father of Metushael. And Methushael was the father of Lamech. Lamech married two women, one named Ada and the other Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who live in tents and raise livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all who play the harp and flute. Zillah also had a son, 
Tubal Cain, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. Tubal Cain's sister was Nama. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to me. Wives of Lamech, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech seventy-seven times. Adam lay with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth, saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel, since Cain killed him. Seth also had a son, and he named him Enosh. At that time, men began to call on the name of the Lord. Okay, now have a couple people share their thoughts on this. What do you think we are supposed to learn from the story of Cain and Abel? One of the most amazing, beautiful things about Scripture to me is it perfectly mirrors how life actually is. In other words, when I think about myself, there are things that I know are true and there's things that I believe about God that make sense, but there's still a lot of things that are mystery to me. There are things I I don't understand. There's a lot of places in what we've read in Genesis so far where we get questions and the Bible is just silent, intentionally silent. It, It matches the mystery and the silence we experience in our own lives. So, for example, think about all the discussions you've had over the last couple weeks with your group. Listen to the kind of questions that came up in some groups as they struggled to understand what these first chapters of Genesis were teaching us. Why did God allow the devil to exist? When Eve was tempted, why didn't God intervene or give her a second chance? Why did there have to be the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden anyway? Why did God accept Abel's offering but reject Cain's offering? Why does God allow good people to suffer? On that last one, remember, Abel pleased God. Abel was doing what God delighted in. He was doing everything right. He trusted God. And what was his reward? He got murdered. The Bible is making it explicitly clear to us that just because you love God, And just because you're striving to do the right thing does not mean that bad things are not going to happen to you. The Bible is intentionally showing us this. The Bible is saying to us, God is great and God is good and terrible things happen to good people in this world. Now, in terms of that question, like why did God accept Abel's offering and not Cain's? Doesn't it seem unfair? And think about what it must have felt like for Cain. Like maybe his parents were there watching. Like he's embarrassed in front of everyone. Like, aren't I good enough? What was going on there? To get a clue, listen to what Hebrews tells us. The New Testament book of Hebrews 11.4 says, By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. So we find out it's not so much what they brought, but how they brought it and what it meant. So the scripture in Genesis tells us that Abel brought his first fruits, the firstlings, and he brought their fat. And in in the Hebrew there, what the fat means is he brought the very best he had, the very first things he had to God as an offering. Whereas if you look carefully, what it just says about Cain is he just brought some of the fruit from the field. And so the implication there is, and again, there's still a bit of mystery, but what it implies is the reason one was accepted and the other wasn't, you can't determine that from just looking at the facts on the ground 
It was about what was going on invisibly in the two men's hearts. And so Cain's heart wasn't right. Maybe, maybe he was just going through the motions. Maybe he was hoping he was going to get something out of it. We, we don't really know, but what we do know is that his heart was not in the right place and that Abel's was, that Abel had faith in God. He trusted God. He believed God. He was honoring him, worshiping him in sincerity. Now, here's the thing. If we only saw the facts on the ground in the story of Cain or in our own life, we might conclude that God is not fair. Why would God allow this? Why would God do that? Did God really say? But look again and look carefully at what God actually did say in Genesis 4, verses 6 to 7. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. God is not asking these questions because he doesn't already know the answer. He's asking these questions to help Cain. He wants Cain to stop and think about himself and what is going on inside him instead of just reacting. Why? Why are you so angry? Can you name it, Cain? I know you feel it. Your countenance has dropped. In other words, your whole body is sending out the message, things are not okay. So we know that, and we know that you feel that. But can you name, why is it you're so angry? Are you feeling envy? Are you jealous of your brother? Are you thinking that God has completely rejected you? That is not that he's rejecting your offering, but he's rejecting you as a person. What's going on, Cain? God is trying to help Cain get back on the right track. He says, if you do what is right, you will be accepted. I'm not rejecting you. You still have a chance to thrive and grow. Forget your pride. Learn from this experience. You can grow and learn and be even more than you are now if you'll simply humble yourself and repent. So here's the good news. Even though you feel lousy right now and you don't feel like doing the good thing, the right thing, you can. You have the ability to do it. You can master this and you can live a meaningful life. The key is God wants Cain to succeed. And so how does Cain respond? Does he learn his lesson? No, he digs in his heels, he doubles down, and he goes in the exact opposite direction. Oh yeah? I'll show you all. I'll show you. And what does he do? He commits premeditated murder. He says to his brother, hey, come on out to the field. In other words, where no one else can see. And he kills him. And when God, even then, after that heinous crime, gives him a chance again to repent, like, what have you done? Where is your brother? What does he do? Does he come to his senses? Does he turn around? Does he humble himself? No, he digs in his heels. He doubles down and he lies to God's face. Where is your brother? I don't know. Bold face lie. And these choices, these decisions, these acts in the past have a profound impact on Cain in the future. Our memories remain. Our our past events and choices rewire us. And so what do we find? He then becomes a restless wanderer upon the earth. And so do all his descendants. Do you ever feel like a restless wanderer? upon the earth. So here we have the very first child born after paradise. He lies. He envies. He commits murder. He refuses to repent. And it has an impact on him and all his descendants. 
by the time we get to his great, great, whatever, grandson, listen to what Genesis 4.19 says. Lamach married two women. Lamach said to his wives, I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamach 77 times. Lamach has abandoned the God-given covenant of this relationship between one man and one woman, and now he's practicing polygamy. And, you know, sometimes when we look at the Old Testament, people are like, oh, I don't like the Old Testament because it's, it's so cruel and strict. I mean, the law says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. In other words, the punishment should equal the crime. You know, where's the mercy in that? Well, you can't get to mercy before you get to fair. Look at what Lamach does. Look at what human nature does when it's not restrained by the law. Because a young man struck Lamach, he murdered him. He was over the top, disproportionate vengeance. And this is exactly what we now see today as well. Lying, envy, anger, violence, might makes right. But in a world dominated by the sons of Cain, there is also the sons of of Seth. Genesis 4.26 says, At that time men, that is the sons of Seth, began to call on the name of the Lord. The intimate relationship that Adam and Eve had with God has been broken. But men and women can return to God when they call on the name of the Lord. The Bible says over and over again, those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And 2 Thessalonians says that God saves us by the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit and by believing the truth. So, His Holy Spirit sanctifies our hearts and then He allows us to believe the truth which sanctifies our minds. So, in a world like this, full of envy and strife, how should we live? We turn to the master teacher, Jesus. Jesus came not only to sacrifice himself on the cross to save our souls and redeem us, he came to teach us how to live in a world full of envy and strife. Listen to what he says in Matthew chapter 5. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment, just like Cain. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and think about how Cain and Abel were offering their sacrifices, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. First, be reconciled. Don't just let it simmer. Don't just grow bitter. Even though you don't feel like it, do the right thing and strive to be reconciled to the other person. Strive not to have your anger control you, but the love of God and His grace and mercy control you. Don't have a pity party for yourself. Don't obsess about how unfair the world is. The world is unfair. But what did God say? But if you do right, you will be accepted. All right, so I'd like a few of you to answer the following question. What would you like to do different with your anger or your envy? The story of Cain and Abel is meant to get us to reflect upon our own lives. So here's my last question for you. Cain is promised frustration at work and restlessness in life. How are you experiencing either of these? And on the other hand, 
Where might God be looking on your life with favor? There is so much good and beautiful in this world. There is so much to learn. There is so much to delight in and be curious about. And yet at the same time, we walk in the rubble of the fall of Adam and Eve. We walk in a world full of temptation and anger and envy. So we really do need each other to pray for each other. So the way we want to end today is to have each of you take a moment And just share what others can pray about for you. And again, if you can, talk about your actual self, not somebody else. We we can pray for other people as well, but what can we pray for you about? And again, if you have have no idea, nothing comes to your mind, then say, hey, you guys, would you just pray that I'd walk in God's ways? Would you pray that I would know Him better? Let's take a moment to pray together over each other. And so, house leader, if you would pray last, and then we'll meet back here for the end of our service. Thank you so much for being with all of us today. I hope you've gotten as much out of these four weeks as I have. For me personally, this has been a real blessing. I feel like I've gotten to know some people a lot better, and their faith has been an encouragement to my faith. Thanks for joining us today as we strive to think carefully about our faith. You can help keep this ministry on the air by making a donation at leverington.org. For now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. We'll see you next time.